That's great. Now it's recording again. So it will actually have, um, that won't be on YouTube. Praise the Lord. Any, any other questions about intermolecular forces? All right. So you have ionic forces, which are electrostatic attraction, no shared electrons. You have three types of covalent forces, right? Van der Waals, and then dipole, and then hydrogen bonding. And again, Van der Waals are those little micro dipoles from nonpolar bonds. Dipole interactions come from real dipoles where polar covalent bonds exist. And then uh, you have hydrogen bonding, which is hydrogen and another atom with a lone pair being attracted to a hydrogen that's attached to an atom uh, that's polarized, right? So those, those, the strongest of all of them is the ionic forces. And then the strongest covalent in a molecular force is hydrogen bonding. All right, are we okay with that so far? Yes, sir. And remember, Van der Waals is exhibited by everything. Everything sees uh, Van der Waals, no matter what. Even if it has a dipole, even if it can hydrogen bond, everything is, is, uh, is going to see Van der Waals forces. Right? All right, so now <clears throat> let's talk about physical properties. Because again, all of this is connected to functional groups. Do you see how the dipole-dipole interaction doesn't exist unless there's a functional group present that creates a dipole? Can you see the connection there? All right, you, you wouldn't have a dipole interaction unless there was some functional group that was able to create a dipole, right? Van der Waals is, is, is ubiquitous. Everything can see that, but not everything is gonna have a dipole. The dipole comes from certain functional groups uh, creating those dipoles, <coughs> all right? So let's talk about how these things relate to physical properties. And we're gonna talk about boiling point and melting point. So the boiling point, you know that that's when a, a liquid is converted to a gas, right? And so at the at molecules that only have Van der Waals, when you compare them to molecules with dipole interactions or molecules that hydrogen bond, molecules that have hydrogen bonding normally have higher boiling point. And then molecules that only see Van der Waals will have a lower boiling point. And then there's another distinction you can make if you're comparing two, ty two types of molecules, one with Van der Waals and one without, then you can make another distinction, right? Because then you base it on the surface area, which we're gonna do in a little bit, all right? So the stronger the intermolecular force, the higher the boiling point, the lower it is, the, the, the weaker it is, the lower the boiling point. That's, the, that's the, uh, the rule of thumb for boiling point. Right? Any questions about that? Yes, sir. Did you get the bread? Where? Miss Ann, across the street. What? Okay. I, didn't tell you I, I sent you a text. Just what, if she rings the doorbell, she's bringing banana bread. All right, so let's look at uh, these three examples right here, right? So you got pentane, butanol, and one butanol. Butanol, when you see this, here's another example. So this is all condensed, right? When you see the CHO, what does that mean? Anybody remember? Is it alcohol? Mm -mm. It should look like this, right? C double bond O H. What functional group is that? Carbonyl. What type? What specific type? Oh, uh. You're right. Out. That's right. Out. Come on. Aldehyde. It's aldehyde. Good. Right. Any? Because remember, in these condensed formulas, let's go back to something we learned a couple of weeks ago. This is the condensed form of that, right? So this carbon right here, it can only make four bonds. So it's got one bond to the CH2 to the left of it, one bond to hydrogen, 
and the other two bonds have to be to that oxygen. So that's how I know that that's the abbreviation for an aldehyde. Are we okay with that? Anybody not see that? Yes, no, maybe. Yeah, we're good. All right. All right. So look at the look at the boiling points. Pentane is 36. Butanol is 76. And then one butanol <clears throat> is 118 degrees Celsius. Right? So what's the difference? The oxygen. Okay, come on, speak up. Who? The oxygen and the double bond. Okay, so let's look at, let's examine these for what intermolecular forces they experience, all right? So for pentane, <laughs> excuse me, it's just a straight chain alkane, is that right? Five carbon yes. chain. What, what intermolecular force would that experience? Keep in mind, you have three to choose from, Van der Waal or London forces. Uh, Van der Waal. Go ahead. I said Van der Waals. Yeah, only, right? This is only going to experience Van der Waals forces because there are no other functional groups present, right? What about butanol? It's got an aldehyde in it. And you know, we talked about this a while back, about the carbonyl, how it's polarized, always going to be polarized towards oxygen. So you got a big dipole there. So what for, what intermolecular force would that experience? Dipole, dipole. Dipole. And then Van der Waals also, right? Because everything sees that. And then what about one butanol? What do you think? Hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding. So this is, I'm going to abbreviate. I'm just going to put DP for dipole, even though it's not two words. And then here is hydrogen bonding. You're right. You see the difference? Van der Waals is the weakest intermolecular force. And then dipole is the, in the middle. And then the strongest is hydrogen bonding. And look at the difference in the boiling points. Right? You go from 36 degrees Celsius all the way to 118 degrees Celsius. What's happening is, I want you to think about this in terms of when, when, when you boil something. What, what happens when you're boiling something? Like, let's say, for instance, bonds break. Are you breaking bonds or are you, are you breaking interactions? Interactions. Yeah, you're not really breaking bonds. Because the molecule is still the same in its same form, it's just in a different state, right? You're going from a liquid to a gas, but you're breaking interactions. So uh, if the Van der Waals is the weakest interaction to break, that means that when I boil pentane, right, it's easy to get those pentane. Let me show you. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. It's easy to get those pentane molecules to break apart or to, or to come apart, right? Because again, that's this. Let me make sure I got the right number of carbons on there. All right, you got a bunch of these things just stacked up on each other. Right? But they're only being held together by Van der Waals forces. So when you apply some energy to them, they come apart, right? And that's how you get them, you agitate them, and then you increase the, num the amount of vibrations between the molecules, and then boom, it, you go from a solid, I mean, I'm sorry, from a liquid to a gas. When you have something like butanol, right, you have this alcohol, and then that's going to hydrogen bond with another alcohol, right, which is going to hydrogen bond to another alcohol, right? So all those hydrogen bonds are very strong interactions now, right? All those hydrogen bonds are kind of are, are present, 
in addition to whatever Van der Waals forces are in there as well, right? So when you try to boil that, first you got to get past the hydrogen bonding, and then you got to get past the Van der Waals forces. So that's why the temperature is higher because you, you got multiple interactions that you have to disrupt in order to get this thing to boil. Does that, does that make sense? It does. All right, so you got all these different interactions in here that you have to account for. That's why the boiling point goes up to 118 degrees Celsius. All right, let me ask a question, another question. I'm gonna switch to a different handout. Can y'all still see the screen? Yes. All right, great, 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 great. All right, let's go down to here. And it says, rank the following in order of increasing boiling point. All right, so in that first molecule, we're talking about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbon. So this is octane. All right, and then over here, we have one, So three, four, dimethyl. One day I'm gonna get my life right. Octane. Can somebody Google that? The boiling point for three, four dimethyl octane and for octane. See what you come up with. I have a question. Go ahead. Where did you get the three four from? Like, how do you, I think I remember watching a video on that, but I kind of forgot. That's okay. So let me give you a quick nomenclature tutorial in the midst of functional groups and intermolecular forces. I'm glad you asked that question because I like sneaking in nomenclature, right? So the longest chain here is eight carbons. Right, so that's where the octane part comes from. And then the closest group, right, is here on carbon number three. This is, so this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbons, right? So the, so the, I start counting from the end that has the substituent closest to it. So that's on carb, that's carbon number three. If I start counting from the other end, that would be carbon six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Well, actually, yeah, it will be carbon six. But you always want to give your substituents the lowest number possible. All right, so I'm start counting there. So it's, I have the same substituent on three and four, which is a CH3 group. Right, CH3, we call it a methyl group. Right? So the three, four, it's like, when you're naming a molecule like this, the chain is the, is the street. So octane is the street. The three and the four are the address. That's where the that substituents live on that street. And then mm -hmm. the low, the, uh, so the, the chain is the, the, I mean, the numbers are the location. And then the die part tells you, right? If you have two of the same substituents, you have to use that prefix die. So it'd be, if it was three, it would be tri four tetra, five penta, so on and so forth, right? So the yeah. dye, how many, and then the methyl is the resident. That's who lives at the location. So it's three, four, dimethyl, octane. Octane is the street, three, four is the address, and then the methyl part, that's the residence. Okay, thank you, I like that. Mm -hmm. you we're going to do more. We'll do more. I just don't like teaching nomenclature as a unit because it's boring. It's just a lot of rules. So we'll do it as it pops up. Okay. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay, cool. So did anybody look up the uh, boiling point for 3, 4 dimethyl octane? I did. I don't know if it's the right one. What you got? Um, 
Um, this says 163. 163.2. Fahrenheit or Celsius? Fahrenheit. All right. So now, can you look up octane by itself? It says 258. 258, okay. All right. And that's Fahrenheit, right? Yes. Okay. Look at those two. We're going to work, but we'll get to the one in the middle in a second. But can you see the difference in the 3, 4 dimethyl octane? What's the difference? What's the difference in those two molecules? There's no substituents on octane. Great. Who is that? Amaria. Hope you can hear me clap. <laughs> nice work. No <laughs> substituents you. on octane. That's right. What what do the substituents do on straight chain alkanes? Remember, we talked as as it relates to Van der Waals forces. What do substituents do? Anybody remember? We just said it. Does it polarize? No, it doesn't mm -hmm. polarize. It breaks up, right? It breaks up the continuity. Remember, it, we're talking about all these octanes lined up with each other. What was that word? It was like sterics. Sterics, yes. But when you try to stack these up right here, Right, you try to stack these on top of one another, you got a problem, don't you? Those methyl groups start clashing and they don't want to do that, so they don't stack very well. So that's why the boiling point goes down. Right, you break up <coughs> the, the ability or the number of contact points for your Van der Waals forces. If it's just no substituents, those chains are loving each other. Right, they, they just find those little micro dipoles and they just lay on top of each other. Right, but those branch chains, they don't pack well. And so the, the level of interaction between the molecules is less. So that means when you start agitating them, adding energy to boil them, they come apart easier. Does that make sense? Yes. It's kind of like, think about, we talk, we talk about a strip of Velcro. Think about a strip of Velcro that's just two pieces with nothing in between. And then think about a strip of Velcro here where you put like, I don't know, uh, M&Ms or some Skittles in between it. You think it's going to stick as well? If you put something between those two strips of Velcro, will they stick as well? No. No. So that's what happens when you start putting substituents on. You, you, you decrease the likelihood of those chains seeing each other and finding those uh, opposite charges from those little micro dipoles that goes way down right and so now when you boil it they just come apart with no problem e even though 163 is a pretty high boiling point compared to octane which is 258 right that's a big difference what is that 95 degrees difference almost Right. Are y'all following that? Anybody not understanding that about the boiling point and the uh, surface area and the contact points? Right. So the less contact points you have on something that has Van der Waals forces, the lower the boiling point is going to be. What do you think about the one in the middle? Let me see. Let's see. Let's see if we can name it first. Then I'll have somebody look it up. So you got one. The two, one on the left has Van der Waals. They all do. That's I the did, point. Go ahead. I named it two, three, four, six tetramethyl octane. Look at you. But I'm not sure though, because I count it backwards. Because you said that you always go with the lesser number, and if you count it from left to right, then it'll be like higher numbers. No, no, no. Did you start counting from this end right here? 
Yes, that's what way I started. Okay. You all you always count from the end that has the the substituent closest to it. So that's right. Okay. So you would count right. from that end. So you said one, two, three, four, five, six. So two, three, four, six. Tetramethyl octane. Is that what you said? Yes, sir. Man, you smart. I'm gonna buy you lunch today. Two, three, four, six. Tetramethyl. Tetra is because it's four methyl groups. I need more room. I got to erase this over here. Tetramethyl octane. Good. Can you look that, can you sit somebody look and see if you can find a boiling point for that? It is, um, 195. 195. Okay. Okay. So you see the difference. You see it's still lower than this one, right? Is that right? It's still lower than octane, but it's slightly higher, which is counterintuitive to this one. So what probably happens is you see how the, the branches kind of create some symmetry Yes. So that may be why this particular molecule, right, can pack a little bit better than this one. All right, let's write that down somewhere. Let me erase this and that. And let's say that in the branches. All right, so the branches in this case create a little bit of symmetry. That's why there's a difference in that and the 3,4 dimethyl octane. But neither one of them are as high as octane itself, which is 258. And the reason is because of those branches. But when you compare the two branch ones, it looks like since you have a little bit of symmetry, then uh, that, that ch kind of changes the way that molecule packs because it's all about how those molecules pack in with one another. Any questions? Anybody that jumped off the boat, lost, just lost, swimming out with the sharks? Okay. I'm a little confused. Go ahead. What's the question? Um, like how do you how can you tell which which one has the hydrogen bonds and okay the van der Waals? good question so the van der Waal, everything has van der Waals, right are you following okay. the yes. only the only that's a good question and i'm glad you brought it up the only hydrogen bonding molecules that you're going to see happen in molecules that contain Nitrogen, I think, I, I think this was in that uh, last video I sent out. Nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. Those are your three hydrogen bonding atoms. Okay. Right, so NH, OH, F is gonna, always gonna be by itself, right? Because it can't have a, a, has a halogen, it can only make one bond. But N and O are gonna be within some other molecule. Are you following? Right. F, F will be in a molecule, but it won't have an H on it. But it'll be, it could be attracted to another hydrogen in another mo uh, fluorine-containing molecule. Okay. Yeah. Are we following that? Yes, I'm following that. Okay. All right, cool. So uh, let's look at the next example. It's asking about melting point, which really follows basically the same premise, <clears throat> in, including the symmetry part it follows the same premise, right? The stronger the intermolecular force, the, the uh, lower or yeah, the higher the melting point, the weaker the intermolecular force, the lower the melting point, right? So let's look here. <coughs> and what intermolecular force would you expect to be present here besides van der Waals? Because remember, everything is gonna experience van der Waals forces. What, what other intermolecular force would you expect? Would be hydrogen bonding? Uh, no. It can't hydrogen bond. 
Mm-hmm. Make a hydrogen bomb with, with, with water or a solvent, but with itself, it can't hydrogen bond because you've got to have a OH, NH, or a fluorine present. So it will be dipole. Yeah, it's a dot. So you'll see dipole interaction here, right? And then if you look at the next molecule, what do you think? You got an OH group here. Hydrogen. Yeah, so this will be a hydrogen. This will be able to hydrogen bond with itself, right? So, and then you got a fluorine group here. So normally with fluorine, if you if you're dissolving it in a solvent, it can hydrogen bond. But with itself, it's only gonna you're only gonna see the, the uh, dipole, right? So you got a huge dipole because fluorine is the most electronegative atom in the periodic table. So you got a big dipole there between carbon and fluorine. So we're gonna say dipole, right? That's not to say that it couldn't be attracted to a hydrogen. Uh, another hydrogen on, on another chain of this molecule, but that dipole is so weak between C and H in these, in these chains like this that the attraction is just not there. So it's more dipole than hydrogen bonding, even though fluorine is a hydrogen bonding atom. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. All right. So what do you think? You want to look them up? Let's look them up and see what we get. And then we can talk about it. One, two, three, four. Six, seven, eight. Look, somebody look up one, two, three, four. Octanone. What type of functional group is that, by the way? Because we are still talking about functional groups. Ketone. 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 Man, I wish I had some confetti. I'll just throw it through the screen. Uh, what about the second one? What function? Alcohol. It's an alcohol. That's great. And let's see what, how many carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So somebody look up one, two, three, four, four octanol. Somebody Google that four octanol. And then somebody Google four octanone, O N E. You see how that, the ending of that name t- tells you that it's a ketone. That's what we call a suffix. Right, just like the all tells you it's alcohol. And then uh, somebody look up uh, four fluoro octane. Four fluoro octane. Huh? Four octanol is uh, between 174 and 176 Celsius. Ooh, that's a, that's a big difference. One, but you said between 134 and 176? 174. Okay, so let's pick, let's say 175, just for the continuity. We'll go, we'll pick the number in the middle. What about uh, octanone? Anybody got that one? I need some Jeopardy music playing. Four octanone. That one was four octanone? Uh huh. Uh, 325 Fahrenheit or 163 Celsius. 163 Celsius. Good. And then what about four fluoro octane? Anybody got that? Boiling, I mean, uh, you looked at the melting point or boiling point? Melting point, right? No, those were the that- boiling point. <laughs> All right, we'll we'll let, let's do this. We'll do that. We'll say boiling point because the melting point may be difficult to find because these are all liquids. What about four fluoro octane? Get that five G working. Anybody got it? 
if you put the O before the U in fluorine, it's going to bring up cookies and not It should be F L U O R O. Is that different from perfluorooctane? What do you get? What you got for that? Um, the boiling point it says like one o three to one o four Celsius. You said one o three? Yeah. We'll take it. We'll take it. Let me see, let me see. I just found another one. Let me see if I got a, if it matches. They don't have the boiling point. It just has some other information. But we'll take that. Yeah, we use that 103? Yeah. All right, good. That's that, that gives me that gives us a, a great piece of information. So the boiling point is this does this make sense? Right, we expect the hydrogen bonding alcohol to be higher boiling than everything, right? Right. All right, so we that that makes sense. How do you explain the difference between uh the four fluoro octanone and the four fluoro octane? Because they both they're both dipole. So how do you explain that difference? What do you think? Now keep in mind <coughs> how what what is it about the dipole dipole interaction? Like how does that work? Think about it. How does the dipole dipole interaction work? Doesn't it work something like this? Well, you have an X, two atoms, and one is partially positive, one is partially negative, and then that partially negative one is going to look for another partially positive one like that? Yes. Is that right? Yes. So think about think about this, right? Let's look at the two. This is a, good, a great question, by the way. All right? So if that's how that works, do you think it would work better if you have four positives and four negatives present? If, they, if the partial... Hmm charges are attracted how how much more attractive do you think the full charges will be it'll be better, better right? it'll, be a much stronger, it'll be a much stronger interaction is that right yes sir so, so let's look at the difference in the last two minutes i'm, I'm just going to abbreviate it so if i have something like this right this is only going to be partial even though it's a really strong dipole, it's only gonna have partial charges. But if you look at that ketone, I can actually do resonance on that. And I can give, I can draw a resonance form that looks like this. I don't run out of room. Where carbon is positive, is that right? Can I do that? Yes. Yeah. So which one which one of those things do you think is going to be more attractive to each other? Will it be this one with only partial charges or this one where you have a a full charge possible? The full charge. Yeah. So that's why this is the the ketone has a higher boiling point in this case. I'm going to write this down and I'll post this Just gonna say they have a stronger dipole. Do the resonance. Are y'all follow? Does that make sense? Right? You got a full charge versus a partial charge. A full charge is always gonna be more attractive to another full charge. And the fact that you can do resonance on the ketone makes that dipole interaction even stronger. Yes or no? 
or condom. Mm -hmm. well, when you keep saying full charge, you're talking about the fact that you did like the resonance and then yeah. that extra electron message. Yeah, so in the resonance form, the carbon is fully positive and the oxygen is fully negative. Is that right? Yes. And so when that fully negative oxygen, it's going to line up with another fully positive carbon. You following? Yeah, that makes sense. Here, you only got partial charges, right? This is only partially negative and that's only partially positive. So even though it's a, a really strong dipole, it's not a full charge, full charge. So it's going to be not as strong as that ketone. We're okay with that? Yep. All right, we got to stop. We're one minute over. Who was that, that name? Was that you? Uh, it was hey, me. Kayla? Yes, sir. I could tell by your accent. <laughs> Two, three, four, six, Texas, <laughs> Atlanta, Uh-uh, stop. You need to stop. <laughs> All right, send me your cash out because that was that was really um that was really impressive. So send me your cash out so I can buy you lunch. I did through the private chat. Oh, you sent it already? Yeah, so you'll probably get it once you stop sharing the screen. All right. No problem. Thank All you. Right. Yeah, no problem. Thanks right. for that, for doing that. That was really impressive. Uh, for sure. We're going to stop here. Hopefully that other video from the first half of class before my computer died, hopefully that yeah, did process good. Praise the Lord for that. So I'm going to, this, this lecture will be broken up into two parts. And uh, if you have questions between now and Friday, just email me. And then Friday we'll work on this some more, these intermolecular forces. And we're going to start talking about solubility did i send y'all that sink or swim video yes sir you did all right so we're going to talk about that solubility uh we're going to talk about that on friday all right we're good yes sir have a nice day all right thank y'all